I am Rebecca. This is one of our very first interviews with a featured community expert, Ali Murray, who works at Confluent, which is building a foundational platform for data in motion based on Apache Kafka. She is the senior global community manager at Confluent, is doing a ton of things across the Confluent community, and we're super excited to talk to her today. But before we dive into your specific work thoughts and your approaches to building and nurturing communities, I would be so glad for you to tell us a bit about yourself. Where are you based? What's your day job when you're not being interviewed? Why did you choose a path centered around community? Yes, yeah, so I am originally from Colombia. Um, I have been based in London since 2008 when I came to my MBA and I never went back. Um, I'm the global community manager at Confluent and the first time I stepped into a community role was in 2014 when I started at a company called Datastacks. I didn't really choose this path knowing everything that was in front of me. Um, to be honest, it was a bit of an accident for me to land here. Um, when I was first interviewing at Datastacks, I was actually interviewing for a field marketing role and when I went through the interview process and at the end when they offered me the role, they uh, told me that there was this other role that was the community role that they thought I would be a good fit for. So I told my then hiring manager, who then became my mentor, Christian Hasker, uh, that I didn't really know anything about community. So I was nervous to accept the role. And he said, well, nobody does. Nobody knows anything about it. And we can learn together and you can learn on the go. And um, I did ask him what he thought about, what, what his advice would be. And he said, if you don't like it, you can always go back to field marketing. But if you do like it, it can become really valuable for your career in the future and it can be something that you really enjoy. And I liked it. I loved it. I fell in love with it. I am still in love with it seven years in and uh, it was a great advice and one of the best pieces of advice I've gotten uh, from him as a mentor and from um, him as a, from a manager in general. So I am really glad that that he had that vision. He's a, he's a community visionary. So uh, it was it was great to learn next next to him and, and together. That is amazing. I am wondering if after seven years uh, and that answer, right? He's like, well, no one knows about community. Nobody, nobody does. Does that still feel true in a lot of in a lot of ways to you? So I, I can see that there's definitely more of it, more knowledge and more experience around, but there's still quite uh, just a new, a new um, field really. So to find someone with a lot of experience is very unique, um, but so to hire is quite difficult. I think also the fact that in the world in general, we're more focused around building people together and bringing communities together, whether it's the tech industry or not. I think that has brought a lot of interest to the community uh, industry itself, so sub-industry of community. So I do see that there's a lot more um, buzz around that, um, but it's still, it's still quite a new thing. I mean, seven years, 10 years is just really nothing compared to many of the other industries or fields. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing more and more people learning about it because the more they do, then the more the new ideas and new strategies we can all work towards and, and grow uh, from learning, learning from each other. So yeah. Nice. But let's go back to when you first started. Well, it was after data stacks, but then you first started at Confluent and you're in charge of the EMEA based communities. Um, and then you grew to lead the total global community program. And so, you know, at differences of scale and differences of culture and differences of even your own knowledge, I'm wondering if there were any similarities and differences to note about the size or the structure or the expectations when you're leading those two community programs. I had the opportunity to start a whole community strategy from scratch at Confluent. And I felt that I had the freedom to build a community strategy how I wanted to build it. Um, yeah, part of that strategy, and I can imagine some of the pressure of that, right, is that you're going to seed and grow 
a totally new community program, which at Confluent you call a Confluent Community Catalyst Program, and which now you have launched almost two years ago. So happy nearly anniversary, May 2019. Um, can you take us in the way back machine and tell us about the why? Yeah, so the Catalyst Program is our MVP program, and it was something I wanted to build from the beginning, from when I started at Confluent. So we started the Catalyst Program in order to recognize the you know, amazing work and contributions of people around the community. Um, and the goal was really just always to highlight how special people are and for them to keep motivated to work with the community. We didn't really hear about any problems that we wanted to solve with this. It was mainly a case of just recognizing people for their efforts. And really the only thing that I was hoping for this was just to build people up, uh, for them to be recognized and uh, recognized in the community and within the community and that way uh, we were hoping that they could feel confident enough to build others up as well and and build the people that that come behind them something that i do find also or what i hear a lot in the community space is that key moment of identifying a champion um how did you identify your champions at that time so it was definitely a very uh, personal relationship building that we had to do. So it wasn't really very scalable. And that's actually one of the things that I'm looking forward to get from Common Room is being able to scale that program in a way that, you know, it gives us visibility to people and places that we didn't have visibility before or that we were not looking at. And it is just so easy to be focused on what we know or who we know or what we're used to look at. But being able to identify people for their contributions on like a single pane of glass and we, we can see everything that they're contributing uh, uh, to and be able to identify not only the champions, but also the influencers in our community. I think that's something that's really great and is really rich. Um, before and how we had been doing it until now is literally been who do we know? Have have we heard of someone? Hey, do you know someone? Do you hear someone? Let's go platform by platform and individually try to assess who is who and who's where in, in the stage of the community maturity. And that has definitely been a challenge that I'm looking forward to uh, helping with uh, tools like the one you're building. Yeah, I was um, the lead of the AWS serverless heroes in my past job, and I did find it, um, it is special because it's like, you know, building personal relationships, but it's certainly not scalable. Um, but something that was cool was one of the best ways to find new, to, to find, to identify new champions was also to ask our current ones, because we were basically like, who do you love to follow? And if you love to follow them, then we should probably be learning about them too. Um, but it's certainly much harder to scale that way. Definitely, I agree, yeah. Um, so I think I read this right, and please forgive me if I didn't. It's the Community Confluent Community Catalyst Program is an annual rotation, correct? Yes, that's right. Um, and so I'm wondering about uh, a little bit about how you just landed on the yearly structure and what kinds of things um, people in the program usually do within that year. Yeah, so the main reason for this to be an annual rotation program is to give others the opportunity to step up and shine, really. I've noticed that a lot of the time people are active in these programs at certain stages of their work life. Um, like a lot of the times they just get busy or they change direction in their company or they just don't have time to put into the community. So I didn't want to put pressure on people that for the fact that they are a catalyst, they had to contribute or they had to be constantly present. But also I think that rotation allows for us to always find new faces and if you're still working with the community and you're still contributing then you can definitely get nominated again and be chosen again but i think that by rotating yearly we motivate people not only to keep working towards the position but also for new people to know that they're they always have a chance to be recognized as well and we have decided to um recognize people or or to do the, the nomination process in a way that it allows different types of personalities to shine. So we decided to, that our requirements could be something like, uh, you know, 
contributions behind your desk, you know, behind your laptop. So contributions to GitHub, to code, to writing blogs or anything like that. But we also are able to recognize people that love being in front of other people. So speakers and people that do podcasts and interviews and, you know, all these, these different types of personality and we recognize them equally because we understand that there's different types of personalities and we didn't want to favor one to the other. So that's what they basically need to do. So they need to have three requirements. So it could be mixed. It could be that you want to talk and contribute it uh to code and also wrote a blog post or it could be that you talked at three different conferences or two conferences that a meetup you can mix and match however that suits you but that way it gives people the opportunity to just shine according to their own personalities um so i want to go a little bit beyond as well this like comprehensive community program which is huge but there's also like so many other channels right that you built into that original strategy that you brought to confluent um, and you shout out, you discussed this a little bit on the streaming audio podcast with Tim Berglund and your team did a great job with that podcast in, in general. Um, so kudos, Tim. Thanks for podcasting. Um, so you talk about hosting formal and informal events. Um, you also talk about the MVP program, which is the community catalyst program. Um, and then you talk about hosting hackathons, enabling meetups, inviting community members to the Slack channel, um, which I think had like over 17,000 members when you quoted that number last year. So I'm sure it's much beyond that. Um, how did you decide on opening and supporting these specific channels in ways to connect with people? And which other channels did you perhaps consider but choose not to focus on? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so at the beginning of my time at Confluent, I sat down and built a strategy based on five pillars. And I did this based on the experience that I had from my previous job and what I thought would be the best initial strategy to get the community excited. But these five pillars include um, the hackathon, the leaders pillar, digital platforms, conferences, and meetups. And the components that roll under each pillar have changed over the years. Uh, and that has changed according to the maturity and the stage of the community. Uh, for example, I think meetups are a key component in a community strategy because it's one of the most comprehensive programs that there are for community benefit. So they are completely free educational events where people interact and network, talk to like-minded individuals, they find jobs, they make friends, they hire other people. So in my opinion, those are all fact, like key factors for, the, for a healthy community uh, or for the health of a community. But then you have other programs like conferences where we go to keep ourselves up to date with what other people in the industry are doing. But also it is one of the few places where we can feed our community flywheel, meaning it's one of the few places where we can go and talk to people about our technologies and our community. And it's people that have never heard of of us before, uh, because if you think about the other pillars, it needs to be people that are already familiar with what we do or who we are. So conferences is one of those places where we are able to have an opportunity to talk to people who don't know who we are yet. So that's why we think it's very important. Um, in the leaders pillar, well, you have the MVP program, which is our catalysts, um, at which I spoke about just before, but we also are starting to see a lot of interest from people to hear about what others are doing in the community so what are they doing with the technology you know who who are they so we're adding a use cases um program to that pillar this year and that's how it's been happening so we build this the, the initial structure and we have been either taking away or adding up to those uh, pillars according to what we hear from the community or what we think that will keep them engaged so these uh, in this case we're adding a use cases pillar this year because that's what we have been hearing that is important for them um, and then regarding the digital platforms there first thing i did was set up our slack space which today actually has twenty eight thousand people um so it's just it's just great it's been growing a lot and the main idea with this was just to give the community a space and a platform for them to interact with each other from anywhere in the world so like at meetups you are or were before the pandemic limited to your physical location 
Uh, but with digital platforms, you're able to interact from anywhere in the world. So being able to have that space for people to, to connect from anywhere in the world and build that community feeling uh, in a space that didn't depend on their physical location was really important. And then, um, as I was going to say, we saw a need to uh, have those Slack conversations searchable, to have history, uh, retain history on those conversations, and it's something that Slack doesn't provide. So we opened our forum on this course, which allows for this to happen. So as you can see, it's just been like we decided to do the initial strategy, but also it's been modifying and adapting to the needs uh, of the community at that exact stage. So. Um, I mean, I also believe communities are different. Every community is different and they matures in a different way uh, and it wants different things. So I think you got to listen to your community in order to understand what they want and what will work for them. I don't think it's like a one size fits all strategy. Uh, I think it's a matter of just listening and trying to understand and bring uh, to the community what, what we think that they that they need and they want, but also just to listen a lot and also to try, right? To try and, and fail or try and succeed or, you know, but if you don't try, I think um, there's no way of knowing what your, commu your community likes. Yeah, and I love that. I think most times people are like willing to give, you know, leeway when at least you're trying something. They're like, hey, thanks. Like, thanks for trying something on our behalf. Um, something I think is super interesting is that you're introducing that use case pillar based on what you heard from them. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if are there specific ways that you reach out to hear from your community? Is it coming in from all different ways? Or are you mostly asking like Slack polls? Are you mostly asking like, Twitter polls? Are you sending specific emails? Like I'm wondering the best way to hear from someone from your community members quickly to inform something like putting on a new use case pillar. So actually that's interesting that you asked that because that's what I'm using common, common room for. So we are basically, this is the first time we're, we're using it for, for something like this. And what we're doing is we are identifying our top 100 influencers in the community with Common Room. And now we're reaching out to them individually to ask for what they're doing and what their use case is. And are they interested in sharing that with the rest of the community? So that has actually been a huge help for us to do this because before what we were doing was just sending generic emails to everyone in the community asking, hey, you know, like, is it, does anyone want to do this? Does anyone want to speak about that? And the engagement was very low, really. So the way we're doing this this time is um, a, a targeted, you know, uh, purpose, purposely networking and purposely targeting the people that we know are very involved in the community and the people that we know are influencing our community in some ways. And we're asking them directly. So it's like, okay, Rebecca, we know who you are. We know what you've contributed. <laughs> uh, we want to know what you're doing with this technology. Would you want to do you want to uh, share it with the world? It has way more weight and way more the chance to succeed than if you just send that generic email with a form and say, hey, anyone can someone just you know, help us and, and, and share their use case. So that's one of the very valuable um, ways we've, we've seen that we can use Common Room for actually. I um, am so glad to hear that. And also what a nice surprise, because obviously we just accidentally walked into that question, but woo, as you've spoken about before, and I've, I've listened to you speak on this topic, um, a super engaged community helps build the momentum for a super engaged community. So that's, yeah, that's great. If you were mentoring a new community manager who is like, okay, I need to build community. I am Ollie Murray starting at Datastax years ago. Um, what, what might you tell them? Like, is there a certain place where today, uh, where would they start? Would you say like, you should start with a specific channel or a specific type of content or a specific type of outreach? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I really encourage people that start working in community to see this as a labor of love and not a place to gather leads or to build pipeline. I think if that's clear from the beginning, then your whole strategy will fall from there in the right place. But if it doesn't, you'll fall in the wrong place. So 
I think that if we know that we are doing this in order to help people understand the technology and educate them and educate them for free and help them use the technology and use it well, then we're going to be able, be able to build a more um, healthy community and a more engaged community. But I feel that when that doesn't happen from the beginning, it's just going to fall in the, in the, in the wrong type of strategy. And it ends up becoming a, a marketing strategy, which is not ideal. The idea is to build a community strategy, not a marketing strategy. So um, it's difficult to find companies that understand this, though. Uh, and I really encourage people to have that clear from the beginning and have that clarity with the executive level because if you have that support then everything else falls in place so that's one of the things i say uh, and then another thing is i do really encourage people to do meetups even if they are not in person right now because obviously we're in an online world as it stands but even if it is just online or whatever it's it's places where actually you build community so it's like if you think about what actually builds community not how i can just send people to something or uh you know like just get people to do something that i want them to do but actually how do you put uh, 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 in place platforms and spaces for people to actually build a community and 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 if that is clear from the beginning then all the other strategies that you build will also fall in the right in the right place so yeah i mean those are the main two things i mean another thing is to really get to get your hands dirty and get to know people there's no you know golden button that you touch and then it just you know creates a strategy or or, or finds the people is really hard work and it's really personal and it's really about building relationships um, and another thing that I encourage is the, the top-down culture. People will follow what you just said, right? If a healthy community builds a healthy community and people will follow that from the very top uh, people from the community. So whether that is you or whether that is your CEO or whether that is a, just a community person that you think people follow, if they are Cold, uh, like like cultured, educated, nice people that are willing to educate others for the sake of the benefit of the community and not themselves, then people will follow the lead for that. So that's just another thing that I think is very important. When you're looking for people for your own community team, um, can you describe some of the qualities or experiences or approaches that you look for in potential new team members? So one of the things that I look for is people that are empathetic and people that are humble. You cannot come to this with a big ego, you know, no one's going to respond to that because it's just not part of a healthy community. Uh, so someone who's humble, someone who speaks nicely to community members as they want people to speak to them, you know, so a lot of the times you find people online that just are very harsh or very direct or very straightforward. And a lot of the times what I like to tell my team members is let's remember that English is not the first language for a lot of people, it's not for me. So I understand that a lot of the times I say something and it it, it just uh, sounds harsh or it sounds in a way that I would, I didn't intend it to, to sound. So it's not that people are wanting to be rude, so they shouldn't be met with the same rudeness, which will always be, give be, uh, people the benefit of the doubt. But also, if we want to build a multicultural community and an inclusive community, we always need to come from a place of empathy. So I'm looking for an empathetic person that uh, normally is open or has had experience to, to working with different cultures and different kinds of people because I feel that that gives that empathy a little bit of a or a, or a next level uh, for, for this job. Um, and then another thing that I, I look for is someone who is incredibly structured and organized because it is you can get lost in all the strategies and all the programs and all the all the stuff that we do and all the day to day. So someone who's very structured and very organized and knows why we're doing things and and how like that, what we're doing them for, it's it's very important. So being able to um, 
build relationships in a structured and organized way is not something that comes so easily to, to a lot of people. I'm curious if, and we're going off script a little bit, but I am curious um, if there's a certain way or, or types of questions you ask to get at that heart of empathy, right? To try to understand how someone approaches a new situation that might feel a little unfamiliar and if they can bring empathy to that situation. Um, are there any things that as a hiring manager you've found help you understand whether or not someone understands the value and the impact of being able to have empathy um, with other people? Yeah, so it's very difficult. Uh, and I think one of the key things for that to happen is for them to speak to a lot of people. You cannot close the process to only your team. I like them meeting team members from other teams or, you know, like uh, from a totally different uh, team in the organization, from a sales team, from an engineering team. And that way I, I'll be able to assess with their own, um, feedback the feedback from all these people from around the company what they were like with them and how did they speak to them so i feel that being able to build that um inclusivity from a, an interview process is really important because if you ask them to speak to everyone that's like-minded then we're all going to think the same right so if i ask them to speak to everyone from my team or you know from people that think like me or uh you know speak like me in, in in a community in a community language sense then we're all gonna perceive the same but when i ask them to speak to different people across the organization is when i really kind of says the empathy they have for speaking to different people from different groups um and i think that's one a, a key so as a particular question i don't think there's a particular question that's like oh, okay they're empathetic uh, i think it's just more like a set of behaviors that people uh, can uh, come across in an interview uh, with and uh, definitely a set of behaviors changes depending on the people they're speaking to. Okay, the last thing which we're super excited about and for anyone who's watching this interview or maybe it's the first time uh, reading the Uncommon newsletter, I'm super excited to keep sharing the Uncommon Support Fund. Um, and this is important to us at Uncommon and at Common Room because we think it's super important to embody what we believe, which is that a community is strongest when it uplifts one another. And so to that end, we're asking every uh, featured expert that we get to talk to like you um, to choose a STEM or a tech nonprofit whose cause and mission you want to highlight or whose cause and mission Confluent loves to highlight um, and Uncommon will donate on your behalf in your honor for your time. Um, so can you tell us a bit about the organization you and Confluent chose to dedicate your uncommon support to? Oh, that's very kind. Thank you. That's a that's a nice surprise. Um, I really like DevOx for kids. Uh, I think that giving kids opportunities to uh, learn about the technology uh, gets them, gives them a lot of um, just opportunities from a mental health perspective and from a work perspective in, in the future as well. But there's something that I've always said, and is that if I cannot change the world myself, I want to give people the opportunity and the platforms to change the world themselves. And that's why I love, love working in community. And I think that that uh, organization is definitely perfect for that, is giving the chance to someone else to change the world. And I love that. Thank you. Ali, thank you so much for your time. Hello to your mom. Well, great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and for you to set this space for us to chat.